Well, it is really wonderful to add a new distinguished voice to the many who have graced this podium over many years now. We have this evening the Honourable Anthony Albanese, Member for Grandler since 1996, once Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Infrastructure and uh, tra Transport, Minister for Regional Development and Local Government, and Leader of the House, the position occupied by Christopher Pine now, where the Canberra Times once said he is a standout performance for Labor. At the beginning of the shaky Gillard regime, uh, Mr Albanese was crucial in conciliating and negotiating with the independent members who helped form a minority government at that time, uh, Rob Oakeshott and our local hero, Tony Windsor. He, he was raised by a single mum in Camperdown who instilled within him three abiding and strong faiths. First of all, the Catholic Church. Secondly, Labor politics. And thirdly, the Rabbitohs. I'm not sure which uh, of these takes precedence. Probably they have an equal standing in his, uh, in his uh, estimation. He was mentored by an old Labor war horse, Tom Uren, and I'm sure he would carry a legacy from him to this day. Besides being distinguished by being my daughter's MP, he is married to the great former Deputy Premier, Carmel Tebbit. Imagine in the one household a Deputy Prime Minister and a Deputy Premier. He has championed great and often controversial causes. For example, euthanasia and superannuation for single, sing, single sorry, superannuation rights for same-sex couples. And now, of course, that has blossomed into uh, concern and advoc advocacy for same-sex marriage. He's against nuclear energy for economic, environment and social reasons, and he stands up stoutly for the working class of Australia and for progressive politics. He wants a new Sid Sydney airport to ease the uh, noise that uh, affects his electorate in inner city in Grandler. And uh, he wants the aircraft out of there. But he's not against all craft because he has taken under his wing the idea of craft beer making as a very particular infrastructure for Australia. Um, now, his preference is for little kegs, not big kegs. I don't know how that would go down with some members of the college. But uh, it's not to do with his gustatory preference or his natural abstemiousness, but it is a matter of economics and politics. Because the big kegs apparently attract a much lighter uh, excise duty than little kegs. And Mr Albanese is standing up for the small person in business to uh, make their way and actually to uh, compete on an even footing. But at the moment, it's the big guys with the big kegs who've got the, uh, the running. So, um, I know that he has three very great loves. First of all, the Rabbitohs, South Sydney Foot Foot Rugby League Football Club, rock and roll, and back in uh, 2013, some of you may remember that he actually hosted a, a program of rage. I don't know if he lasted the whole night, but probably he did. <laughs> and he's asked to comment on the leadership struggles within his party and his Great like is, he says, I like fighting Tories, neatly deflecting the question that comes towards him. There's a great climate change in Western countries these days, Western democracy in particular. This is known to everybody nowadays because of the Brexit vote, the election of uh, Donald Trump, the great successes of, uh, not quite complete successes, but great progress made by Jeremy Corbyn in Britain and Bernie Sanders in the United States. And neoliberalism is, we think, really passing, retiring back into proper liberalism and perhaps social liberalism as well. And I reckon Albo is exactly the man to take tap into this current, this current of climate and opinion in these days. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great privilege to introduce to you the Honourable Anthony Albanese, MP.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Maddox, and uh, it was a very generous uh, introduction. Uh, perhaps um, when I finish my political career, I'll be remembered as someone who advocated a second airport, who added $30 billion to the economy through national regulators, but perhaps most popularly, allowed craft beer to be taxed at the same rate as the big guys. <laughs> I know what will be more popular with the students at Earl Page College. <laughs> I know my audience. Can I thank you very much for the welcome to country and I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and pay my respect to their elders past, present and future. To the Vice-Chancellor, Professor Duncan, to the Chancellor, James Harris, the Deputy Chancellor, Jan McClelland, to university senior executives, head of school and UNE personnel, to uh, Cathy Hunt, uh, the head of Earl Page College, uh, academics, university community, and perhaps most importantly at a university, because it doesn't exist without them, students. It's fantastic to have the opportunity to give the 34th annual Earl Page Lecture for 2000 and 17. Now here I am as a former Labor Deputy Prime Minister in New England. The electorate of the current Deputy Prime Minister and National Party leader Barnaby Joyce giving a lecture named after the country party leader Sir Earl Page who rose to be Prime Minister even if just for three weeks. It struck me that my very presence here this evening giving this lecture could be seen as a metaphor for what is my theme tonight, positive politics in the age of disruption. We certainly live in a period where politics as usual has been turned on its head. Traditional allegiances are far less entrenched. In the United States, we've seen the rise of what uh, people thought couldn't happen, President Donald Trump. In the United Kingdom, Jeremy Corbyn is within reach of becoming Prime Minister of the UK. In France, Emmanuel Macron uh, resigned as a former Socialist Party minister in the government, ran as president and was successful, then formed a political party which won an overwhelming majority of seats just months after. An extraordinary outcome. Time and again, we've seen orthodoxy abandoned in favour of candidates and platforms of the right, the left and the centre. But what these movements have in, have in common is that they've tapped into an increasing dissatisfaction with the outcomes of economic globalisation. This is despite the fact that there have been substantial benefits accrue from globalisation, which have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Products in Australia that were once considered luxury items are now much more available. When I was a child there in Camperdown, uh, we had a home phone. It had a money box next to it because the neighbours would have to knock on the door to use our phone and they'd deposit a coin in the money box to be able to pay the phone bill. It was seen as a luxury. Today, there are many more mobile phones than there are people. Plane travel today is five times more affordable than it was 20 years ago. My first uh, plane flight was as an advisor uh, to Tom Uren uh, when I flew uh, to Canberra uh, in my early 20s, having graduated uh, from Sydney University. Today, my son uh, goes to the local high school. Uh, most of his friends at that local high school in a working part of Sydney have all been not just on domestic flights, but international flights. It is a different world. Australians have never been better educated and we're living longer. But the simple fact is that some have benefited much more from globalisation than others. And the consequences of this are broad reaching, with many turning to ballot boxes at election time to express their resentment. 
The current political shake-up can be traced in an immediate sense, I believe, to the global financial crisis. Literally millions of people lost their jobs, people lost their homes, people were placed under enormous pressure around the world. The fact is that, by and large, those who were responsible for that crisis uh, not only survived, but some of them did pretty well out of it. People saw that this was a stark demonstration of the power distribution in society and the inequality of that power distribution. It led to a critique of neoliberal economics and a recognition that without government intervention, markets can create bad outcomes and almost always create unequal outcomes. Unpredictable election outcomes and expressions of dissatisfaction with the prevailing order, exemplified by the Brexit decision, have been described as politics in the age of disruption. This has led many active participants and commentators to be negative about the future. I think this assessment is wrong and I think it's self-defeating. In our pursuit of change, it can feel like every time we take one step forward, it's followed by two steps back. But as Barack Obama once said, if you're walking down the right path and you're willing to keep walking, eventually you'll make progress. Tonight I'll argue in the words of musician Ian Dury, there are indeed reasons to be cheerful. Of course, there are many across the political spectrum who define present circumstances negatively and who romanticise the past. For progressives who, by definition, believe in the better instincts of humanity, this is very much a contradictory trait. I've been in many debates with people who assert with despair, our oh, Labor isn't what it used to be. My response is, that's true. We no longer support the White Australia policy, which we did. We now support equal representation of women, which we didn't. We now support removing areas of discrimination based upon people's sexuality, once seen as an obscure issue. The fact is that political parties evolve with society, and my argument tonight is that over time, that change is progressive. This approach is consistent, I believe, with a faith in humanity. Progressives consistently fail to celebrate our victories. Sometimes this is because we've already moved on to the next challenge. If you're about defending existing power relationships in society, you don't have that issue. You celebrate the past almost by definition. But to inspire the next generation, including the students at this university, we should seek to understand the past, celebrate the gains of the present, and both anticipate and importantly create the future because social change doesn't just happen, it is made to happen by us. I believe that an analysis which is optimistic about future prospects is a precondition for inspiring that positive change. In Australia, it's fair to say that in recent years, we have seen an increase in negative politics, at least on a superficial level. We've had changes of Prime Minister, with two replaced in the first term, after their election. The question is, will this instability become a permanent feature of the political landscape? There's no doubt that the pace of the media is having an impact. Complex issues, even by the leader of the free world, can't be addressed in 140 characters. <laughs> the immediacy of online news websites means that no one wants to miss a big event so detailed discussion of ideas is reduced to political power plays. Often the media end up creating the event by getting ahead of it, predicting it, and therefore making it more likely that it will happen. And hence, I think the media have played a role in the political instability which is there. The fact is that all of these changes make a mature discussion of the challenges which Australia and the world faces much more difficult. This can advantage the opposition, but a plan to get in a government 
doesn't equate to a plan to govern, as we saw with Tony Abbott. Labor has been determined to not repeat this mistake and has worked hard on comprehensive policy plans. And I think Bill Shorten deserves credit for leading from opposition on difficult issues such as the reform to negative gearing and capital gains tax so necessary to improve housing affordability. The Australian people are desperate, I believe, for an end to disruption. I think that's why Malcolm Turnbull's ascension to the Prime Ministership was welcomed so strongly. Australians breathed a sigh of relief, no matter what way they voted at the 2013 election. His statement that he would treat the population like adults and move to less divisive political leadership appealed to a public that had been simply exhausted by what it perceived as consistently negative politics. It was indeed positive politics in the age of disruption. Unfortunately, it's become clear that the internal compromises uh, which Mr Turnbull made to secure support have led to disappointment. Both major parties clearly have a vested interest in renewing faith in mainstream politics. I want to outline some of the long-term challenges that Australia faces, which if we can work through as a nation will be critical in changing politics in Australia for the better. I'd argue that these are consistent with the politics of the last century, which has seen the promotion of progressive ideas that are seen as radical at first, then become accepted over time as a result of community support. Let me give you some evidence to back up that claim. Medicare, compulsory superannuation, expanding access to education are fundamental issues that were fought strongly by the forces of reaction but are now cemented as part of the Australian ethos. Medibank introduced by Whitlam, abolished by Fraser, reintroduced as Medicare by Hawke, entrenched over a long-term period by that Labor government, now people campaigning to show how much they support it as the foundation stone of the health system. When governments attempt to attack the Australian consensus and things that have been overwhelmingly agreed by the public, the fact is uh, that uh, the opposition uh, for, of the public meets them uh, front and, and squarely. That happened, I think, with the 2014 budget where there was overreach in terms of the uh, attempt to wind back uh, some of the gains of the past. Nowhere is this stronger, though, I think, than in social policy. Whilst there's more to be done, removing much of the discrimination on the basis of gender, ethnicity and sexuality has already made a fundamental difference. The first woman elected to the House of Representatives from New South Wales was my predecessor as a member for Grainler when she was elected in Phillip in 1983. Just think about that for a moment. The biggest state in the Commonwealth, 83 years, not a single woman, not one from any electorate, from any political party over that time. An extraordinary uh, figure which uh, I'm sure that, uh, I, I hope that the young people here are shocked by. Since then, just since 1983, 107 women have been elected to the House of Representatives across Australia and at the last election we elected the first Indigenous woman, a remarkable woman indeed, in Linda Burney. The refusal to offer an apology to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people eventually was overwhelmed. Kevin Rudd's apology, seen as controversial even at the time, even at the time where now senior members of the government boycotted uh, that apology on the floor of the House of Representatives, was, I believe, the finest moment, bar none, a long way back to second, of the parliament this century. It united us as a nation and was an important step, not the last step, 
but an important precondition for advancing reconciliation and is uh, certainly uh, the proudest moment I've had as a member of parliament. As the professor said in my first term in 1998, I introduced a private member's bill to give same-sex partners access to their superannuation. When I first raised it in the Labor caucus, people shuffled in their chair. They were uncomfortable with someone talking about sexuality uh, as a federal parliamentarian. It was blocked, not just from a vote, it was blocked even from having a debate. I found out later that uh, many people who didn't know me or my much better half, Carmel Tebbett, uh, assumed that I must be gay because why else would someone be raising the issue of equality for same-sex couples unless they had a direct interest in it? And yet the parliament united when uh, we were in office in our first term after 2007 to remove 84 pieces of discrimination in legislation against same-sex couples, not just in superannuation, but immigration, health and education. It was largely uncontroversial and it received bipartisan support. The debate had moved a long, long way in a very short period of time. The unfinished business of marriage equality now has a majority of support both inside and outside parliament. And when it happens with a vote from the parliament, which is the only way that it can be changed, people will wonder what the fuss was about. The recent budget saw the coalition adopt some of the central principles, at least rhetorically, that have been advanced by Labor in recent years. While the change of rhetoric is welcome, we also, of course, need a change of substance. But this included an acceptance that Australians see Medicare as the central component of the provision of universal health care, that school funding should be needs-based, that the NDIS is critical reform, that infrastructure investment in our regions and cities, which boosts economic productivity, is good debt. This is a start, and motivations have been questioned. But while words can be positive, it is, of course, actions that count. But it does seem to me that stating that these principles have been broadly accepted, at least in the rhetorical sense, should be a source of pride for those who have been long-term advocates for these positions. And it certainly does not mean that there are not arguments to be had about the sincerity of this broad adoption, let alone the practical implementation of those principles. The principle of universal health care needs to be supported by the Medicare rebate and hospital funding being improved. The principle of needs-based education funding must be supported by resourcing to allow the full Gonski to be delivered. And we need to enhance the role of early childhood education in realising the potential of our younger generations. The principle of infrastructure development needs to be supported by real investment not the cuts that were in this year's budget. The rhetorical acceptance of, this of these previously contested positions, such as needs-based education funding, should facilitate a focus on how to achieve these objectives. Moving on from old arguments should also permit greater consideration of the long-term challenges which face Australia. Tonight I want to discuss just a few of those. Infrastructure, including the MBN, climate change and inequality. On infrastructure, the government raised expectations prior to the budget by accepting what economists, the Reserve Bank, the Business Council of Australia and Labor have been saying for some time, that borrowing for productivity boosting infrastructure is sound economic policy. This is particularly the case given the context of the resources sector moving from the construction to the production phase, the fact that there is low interest rates and the fact that there's a high infrastructure deficit. We know that in the short term infrastructure creates jobs and generates economic activity, but in the long term infrastructure boosts the national economy 
produces revenue for government and makes a return to that national economy. The former Labor government doubled the roads budget, we increased the rail budget by more than 10 times, and we invested more in public transport than all previous governments combined since Federation. Our major reform was the creation of the Independent Advisory Group, Infrastructure Australia, to ensure that the right projects were funded with the right financing and proper planning. This region benefited greatly from the Hunter Expressway, a $1.7 billion investment, which was a central component of the economic stimulus plan. The New England Highway benefited from upgrades to sections both north and south of Armidale. It's often said of politicians they need to get out more. And when it comes to regional infrastructure, there's no doubt that is true. Tony Windsor and I drove the highway. We looked at the Bolivia Hill black spot, and that was enough to convince me that it needed fixing. And that project is now underway, having been funded in the 2013 budget. We also uh, delivered planning and uh, the beginning of the Tenerfield bypass, which is also necessary. We invested in Roads to Recovery, the Black Spot program. We upgraded the livestock selling complex here in Armidale to make it safer for truck drivers and workers. Right across the country, there are good examples of projects that connect people and freight to regional centres. The Inland Rail project is one which has bipartisan support. While we were in government, $900 million was allocated to upgrade existing track and secure the corridor following on from our landmark study. The recent budget committed substantial funding to the Australian Rail Track Corporation for the project, but every dollar of it is equity funding. This contradicts former Deputy Prime Minister John Anderson's review, which found that it would not produce a return on capital for 50 years. I am concerned that the need for grant funding has been ignored and that this will undermine the project in the future as will the fact that current plans have it stopping at Acacia Ridge, some 38 kilometres short of the Port of Brisbane. Projects should be transparent about their finances. The economic development of regional centres such as parks along the route, the pressure taken off the coastal routes and the safety, environmental and economic benefits of replacing heavy vehicle movements with rail, all combine to mean that inland rail is deserving of support but it will fail if its financing is based upon false premises and there is not transparency. Passenger rail is another significant priority for regional communities. The regional rail link in Victoria allows commuters from Ballarat, Bendigo and Geelong rapid access to Melbourne on a new rail line that is separate from the existing Melbourne passenger train network. This was the largest ever Commonwealth investment in a public transport project. But the big game changer is the proposed high speed rail link between Brisbane and Melbourne via Sydney and Canberra. This project demonstrates that carefully targeted Commonwealth investment can make a real difference when it comes to strengthening links between city, cities and regions, lifting productivity for both. It could transform the economies of those regional centres along the route, including Lismore, Grafton, Coffs, Port Macquarie, Taree, Newcastle, Goulburn, Wagga Wagga, Albury and Shepparton. It is positive that the government has recognised rhetorically that there is a role for the Commonwealth in investing in regions and cities, in road and rail, and in moving freight and people, because they're all interconnected. However, by creating an infrastructure financing unit in the Prime Minister's department in the recent budget, it has sidelined Infrastructure Australia. Its insistence that projects must produce a commercial return means that the market will be distorted to just fund toll roads in our cities. This will have a devastating impact on regional Australia, as demonstrated by last week's absurd proposition that the Northern Australian infrastructure facility be used to fund toll roads in far north Queensland. The Infrastructure Australia model is important because it's designed to break the nexus that's there between the short-term political cycle and the long-term infrastructure investment cycle. Long-term investment certainty is required for visionary projects that will make a real difference to our future prosperity. 
The Western Sydney Airport is an example of a project that couldn't proceed without bipartisan support. This project is not only important for the economic transformation of Western Sydney, it's critical for regional New South Wales to have continued access to Sydney for its people and its produce. But of course in the digital age, the easiest way to overcome the tyranny of distance, which disadvantages our regions, is access to a 21st century national broadband network. That means fibre to the premise, certainly not copper. Right here in Armidale was the first mainland community to receive the rollout of the MBN. If a business here in Armidale can have the same access to markets and customers as a business based in Sydney or anywhere in the world, it moves from a position of locational disadvantage to one of advantage due to the lower overhead costs. The same advantage, of course, applies for this outstanding university in a world of competition between universities. High-speed broadband is essential, of course, for uploads, not downloads. And it's extraordinary that so many of my colleagues still think that the MBN and high-speed broadband is about downloading Game of Thrones. <laughs> it's about much more than that, as important as that might be. It's about the provision of health and education services. It's also an enabler for creating opportunity and equity. This makes it an essential component of economic and social policy for the future. And in my view, we shouldn't cop any young person having inadequate broadband more than we'd cop them not having access to energy or to water or the essentials of modern life. Climate change is, of course, our largest intergenerational challenge. Right now, we have an opportunity with the Finkel Review to draw a line in the sand and move forward in a bipartisan way. While the government has agreed to 49 of the 50 suggestions in the review, it hasn't yet reached a decision on the one that really matters, the clean energy target. To be clear, this isn't our preferred path forward, that is for an emissions intensity scheme. But Australians need the current policy paralysis in the energy sector to come to an end and we'll work with the government to achieve this. Since the price on carbon was abolished, the fact is that wholesale energy prices have doubled, have doubled. The policy uncertainty has stifled investment it's undermined the national energy market and it is hurting vulnerable Australians who cannot afford to pay their energy bills. It's bad environmental policy, it's bad international policy, it's bad social policy, but it's also bad economic policy. Alan Finkel himself, the chief scientist of Australia, has said that putting a clean energy target framework in place would see investment restart pollution reduce, job opportunities increase, and a reduction in wholesale power prices. These are all great outcomes. The fact is that most Australians understand the arguments for action. The world is moving towards a low emissions future. Three quarters of Australia's coal and gas generation are already operating today beyond their design life. With Australia's capacity for innovation and our abundant natural resources, we should be a world leader in renewable energy. This policy area exemplifies the need for a consensus about at least the framework moving forward. Indeed, a positive outcome to end the disruption that has caused so much damage over the last decade. It is the poorest people in our communities who wear the brunt of our most significant challenges, and that includes the challenges that I've raised. The provision of infrastructure hurts people based upon income. If you live in a wealthy community, you, chances are you not only uh, don't worry about the cost of putting petrol in your car, you have access to public transport. It's the poorest people in communities who tend to not have access 
to transport options. It's the poorest people in our community who have to think about their energy usage and the cost therein. It's the poorest people in our community who suffer from disadvantage due to digital connectivity issues. And that, of course, has uh, the consequences now that most education services are delivered uh, online uh, from a very early age, as I found out, as, uh, as a father. Uh, the fact is that uh, students who can't afford uh, the latest uh, computer, who can't afford to connect up uh, to broadband, are disadvantaged in a way that simply entrenches existing class relationships and entrenches disadvantage. The impact of climate change impacts disproportionately on the poor, whether considered nationally but particularly considered internationally and the responsibility that we have as a first world nation uh, to those who haven't caused the problem, which is there in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And of course, uh, the transition to renewable energy is something that uh, if uh, you had the capital available to put solar panels on your roof when the rebates were available, chances are uh, you're paying less bills than those people who simply weren't in a position to do that. As governments develop policy solutions, we must consider equity issues or else political disenfranchisement across our nation will only deepen. The fact is that inequality in Australia is at a 75-year high. An Oxfam report recently found that the two, two, Wealthiest Australians own more than the poorest 20% of the population. At a time when real wages are falling and the Reserve Bank Governor has said that we need to increase wages, we've seen cuts to penalty rates, actually reduced the real wages of some of our most poorly paid. The former RBA Governor, Bernie Fraser, has referred to a danger point where the gap between rich and poor could grow so much, it would have awful far-reaching consequences. There is, of course, a spatial dimension as well to inequality in Australia. Uh, research conducted by the Parliamentary Library for this lecture found that out of the bottom 10 electorates for personal median income, nine of these were regional. All nine of the electorates, every single one of the electorates with the highest median income were urban and they were all within short distances of the CBDs of our capital cities. I'm also concerned that we face a very real scenario in a number of communities across Australia where the only way for young people to own their home is to inherit one. The latest census data shows that lower home ownership rates and a decrease in the number of people who've paid off their mortgage. Rental stress is also a growing problem. The percentage of households who are now paying more than 30% of their income in rent has also increased from 10.4% at the time of the last census uh, up to 11.5%. Successful societies are inclusive societies. They're ones where everyone feels like they belong and they have a share in the gains that are made. And I believe uh, very sincerely that you shouldn't be able to judge an individual's economic status by simply looking at their postcode. But here in our cities, and in the division within our cities and the division between cities and regions, it's more and more possible uh, to do that. Given this picture of inequality in Australia, it is tempting for some to turn to negative politics and to blame a group or particular policies for an individual's lived experience falling short of their expectations. And we've seen politicians uh, try uh, to do that to try to succeed based upon division rather than bringing the community with them.
Such an approach is, I believe, short-sighted. It's the easy choice, it's certainly not the right choice. There is, of course, another way forward. Politics at its best offers hope, not fear. It aims to lift people up. We need to ensure that as our nation's wealth grows, the benefits are shared more equally. The common aspiration that we share, the simple view that I've heard my whole life, whether it be from my mother or whether it be from people I've come into contact with, Australians are pretty simple. When you get rid of sort of ideology, they want their kids to have better opportunities than they had. They want their kids and the next generation to inherit a natural environment that is at least as pristine as the one that they've been able to enjoy. I'm struck by the fact that President Obama, uh, when he was here and visited as president, wanted to take his kids to see the Great Barrier Reef to make sure that they got to see it in case that opportunity wasn't there in decades to come. So we have big responsibilities, but I think that those aspirations aren't too much to ask. Those of us who are concerned that the age of disruption could lead to a downward spiral of respect for our institutions and a capacity to deliver real solutions to challenges have a responsibility to engage positively to avert such a scenario. We must secure outcomes in the national interest. We should seek as much consensus as possible, at least on what the big picture objectives are, and then have our arguments about the detail. That includes issues like real needs-based funding for education, investment in infrastructure in the digital economy, regional economic development, and strong and decisive action on climate change. We must continue to be the land of opportunity. If we deal with these challenges, we can create a much more positive political culture and indeed give people, as Ian Jury, always wanted to quote Ian Jury in a speech, um, most of you won't have a clue who he is. Young people, Google him. Reasons to be cheerful, which I think is a great sentiment that we need to bring into politics to get away from some of the division that I think uh, helps people on the fringe of politics. It doesn't help mainstream uh, engagement and it doesn't help governments to be able to deliver for our national interest. Thanks very much.